Chapter 14 of Aircraft and Submarines, Part 2, by Willis J. Abbott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by William Tomko. The Modern Submarine, Part 2. Of the smaller naval powers, Italy comparatively early had become interested in the building of submarines. Most of her boats are of the Laurenti type, which is a very close adaptation of the lake type. Russia and Japan, especially the latter, built up fairly efficient underwater fleets. The lesser countries like Austria, Holland, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and Spain have concerned themselves seriously with the creation of submarine fleets. The submarine boats of all of these countries, in most instances, were either of the Lake or Holland type, though frequently they were built from plans of English, French, or German adaptations, rather than in accordance with the original American plans. The exact number of submarines possessed now by the various navies of the world is a matter of rather indefinite knowledge. Great secrecy has been maintained by every country in this respect. From a variety of sources, however, it has been possible to compile the following list, which at least gives an approximate idea of the respective strength of the various submarine fleets at the beginning of the war. The numbers assigned to each country are only approximate, however, and include both boats then in existence or ordered built. United States, 57. Great Britain, 104. France, 92. Germany, 36. Italy, 28. Russia, 40. Japan, 15. Austria, 12. Holland, 13. Denmark, 15. Sweden, 13, Norway, 4, Greece, 2, Turkey, 2, Brazil, 3, Peru, 2. Having traced the development of the submarine from its earliest beginnings to recent times, we are naturally now confronted with the question, what are the principal requirements and characteristics of the modern submarine? the submarine boat of today, in order to do its work promptly and efficiently must first of all possess seaworthiness this means that no matter whether the sea is quiet or rough the submarine must be able to execute its operations with a fair degree of accuracy and promptness and must also be capable of making continuous headway Surface and underwater navigation must be possible with equal facility, and it is necessary that a state of submergence can be reached without loss of time and without any degree of danger to the boat's safety. At all times, traveling above water or below, the submarine must possess mechanical means which will make it possible to control its evolutions under all conditions. Furthermore, the ability of the submarine to find and to observe objects in its vicinity must not be greatly reduced when it is in a submerged position. In the latter, it also becomes of extreme importance that the provisions for ventilation are such that the crew of the submarine should lose as little as possible in its efficiency and comfort. A fair amount of speed both on and below the surface of the water is essential, and the maintenance of the speed for a fairly long period of time must be assured. In regard to their general outward appearance, submarines of various types today vary comparatively little. In many respects, they resemble closely in shape torpedo boats, the earlier submarine particularly. In size, of course, they differ in accordance with the purposes for which they have been designed. As compared with earlier submarines, the most notable difference is that modern submarines possess more of a superstructure. Almost all of them are built now with double hulls. The space between the outer and the inner hull is utilized primarily for ballast tanks by means of which submergence is accomplished and stability maintained and regulated. Some of these tanks, however, are not used to carry water ballast, but serve as reservoirs for the fuel needed by the engines. The stability of the submarine and the facility with which it can submerge also depend greatly on the distribution of weight of its various parts. This problem has been worked out in such a way that today there is little room for improvement. Its details, however, are of too technical a nature to permit discussion in this place. Hydroplanes both fore and aft are now generally used to assist in regulating and controlling stability in the submerged state. 
the motive power of the modern submarine is invariably of a two-fold type for traveling on the surface internal combustion engines are used the gasoline engine of former years has been displaced by diesel motors or adaptations of them although these represent a wonderful advance over the engines used in the past there is still a great deal of room for improvement the opinions of engineers in this respect vary greatly american opinion being generally unfavorable to the diesel type and whether the final solution of this problem will lie in the direction of a more highly developed motor of diesel type of an improved gasoline engine or of some other engine not yet developed only the future can tell simplicity of construction and reliability of operation are the two essential features which must be possessed by every part of the power plant of a submarine for underwater travel electric motors and storage batteries are employed exclusively these vary of course in detail in principle however they are very much alike although this combination of electric and oil power is largely responsible for having made the submarine what it is today it is far from perfect mechanical complications of many kinds and difficulties of varying degrees result from it up to comparatively recently these were considered insurmountable obstacles but engineers all over the world are giving their most serious attention to the problem of devising a way to remove these obstacles and continuous progress is made by them as an immediate result of the development of motive power in the submarine its speed both on and below the surface of the water as well as its radius of action has been materially increased Today, submarines travel on the water with a speed which even a few years ago would have been thought quite respectable for the most powerful battleships, or the swiftest passenger liners. And even underwater, submarines attain a velocity which is far superior to that of which earlier submarines were capable on the surface of the water. How immensely extended the radius of action of the submarine has become in recent years has impressed itself on the world, especially in the last few years both english and french submarines have traveled without making any stops from their home ports to the dardanelles and back again and used to and satiated as we are with mechanical wonders of all kinds the whole world was amazed when in nineteen sixteen german submarines made successful trips from their home ports to ports in the united states and returned with equal success this meant a minimum radius of action of thirty five hundred miles in the case of the german u-boat which in nineteen sixteen appeared at newport for a few hours then attacked and sank some merchantmen off the united states coast and later was reported as having arrived safely in a german port it has never been established whether the boat renewed its supply of food and fuel on the way or carried enough to make the trip of some seven thousand miles one other important feature without which submarines would have found it impossible to score such accomplishments is the periscope in the beginning periscopes were rather crude appliances they were very weak and sprung leaks frequently moisture formed by condensation made them practically useless in certain positions the image of the object picked up by the periscope became inverted their radius of vision was limited and in every way they proved unreliable and unsatisfactory but just as almost every feature of submarine construction was gradually developed and most every technical obstacle overcome experts gradually concentrated their efforts on the improvement of periscopes modern periscopes are complicated optical instruments which have been developed to a very high point of efficiency a combination of prisms and lenses makes it possible now to see true images clearly appliances have been developed to make the rotation of the periscope safe prompt and easy so that the horizon can be swept readily in every direction magnification can be established at will by special devices easily connected or disconnected with the regular instrument the range of vision of the modern periscope is as remarkable as its other characteristics it differs of course in proportion to the height to which the periscope is elevated above the surface of the water in clear weather a submarine having elevated its periscope to a height of twenty feet can pick up a large battleship at as great a distance as six miles while observers on the latter even if equipped with the most powerful optical instruments are absolutely unable to detect the submarine 
This great distance is reduced to about 4,000 yards if the periscope is only 3 feet above the surface of the water and to about 2,200 yards if the elevation of the periscope is 1 foot. But even the highly developed periscope of today, usually called panoramic periscope, has its limitations. The strain on the observer's eyes is very severe and can be borne only for short periods. In dirty weather, the objectives become cloudy and the images are rendered obscure and indefinite, although this trouble has been corrected, at least in part, by forcing a strong blast to the rim surrounding the observation glass. At night, of course, the periscope is practically useless. Formerly a shot which cut off the periscope near the water's edge might sink the boat. This has been guarded against by cutting off the tube with a heavy plate of transparent glass which does not obstruct vision but shuts off the entrance of water. Important as the periscope is, both as a means of observing the surroundings of the submarine and as a guide in steering it, it is not the only means of accomplishing the latter purpose. Today, every submarine possesses the most reliable type of compass available. At night, when the periscope is practically useless, or in very rough weather, or in case the periscope has been damaged or destroyed, steering is done exclusively by means of the compass. The latest type in use now on submarines is called the gyroscope compass, which is a highly efficient and reliable instrument. In the matter of ventilation, the modern submarine also has reached a high state of perfection. The fresh air supply is provided and regulated in such a manner that most of the discomfort suffered by submarine crews in times past have been eliminated. The grave danger which formerly existed as a result of the poisonous fumes emanating from the storage batteries and accumulators has been reduced to a minimum. In every respect, except that of space, conditions of life in a submarine have been brought to a point where they can be favorably compared with those of boats navigated on the surface of the water. Of course, even at its best, living quarters in a submarine will always be cramped. However, it is so important that submarine crews should be continuously kept on a high plane of efficiency that they are supplied with every conceivable comfort permitted by the natural limitations of submarine construction. Submarine boats so far have been used almost exclusively as instruments of warfare. One of their most important features, therefore, naturally, is their armament. We have already heard something about the use of torpedoes by submarines. The early submarines had, as a rule, only one torpedo tube and were incapable of carrying more than two or three torpedoes. Gradually, however, both the number of torpedo tubes and of torpedoes was increased. The latest type have as many as eight or ten tubes and carry enough torpedoes to permit them to stay away from their base for several weeks. In recent years, submarines have also been armed with guns. Naturally, these have to be of light weight and small caliber. They are usually mounted so that they can be used at a high angle. This is done in order to make it possible for submarines to defend themselves against attacks from airships. The mountings of these guns are constructed in such a way that the guns themselves disappear immediately after discharge and are not visible while not in use. Though mounted on deck, they are aimed and fired from below. As part of the armament of the submarine, we must also consider the additional protection which they receive from having certain essential parts protected by armor plate. All these features have increased the safety of submarine navigation to a great extent. In spite of the popular impression that submarine navigation entailed a greater number of danger factors than navigation on the surface of the water, this is not altogether so. If we stop to consider this subject, we can readily see why rather the opposite should be true. Navigation under the surface of the water greatly reduces the possibility of collision and also the dangers arising from rough weather for the results of the latter are felt to a much lesser degree below than on the surface of the water. Many other factors are responsible for the comparatively high degree of safety inherent in submarines. Up to the outbreak of the present war, only about 250 lives had been lost as a result to accidents to modern submarines. Considering that up to 1910 a great deal of submarine navigation was more or less experimental, this is a record which can bear favorable comparison with similar records established by overwater navigation or by navigation in the air.
To the average man, the thought of imprisonment in a steel tube beneath the surface of the sea and being suddenly deprived of all means of bringing it up to air and light is a terrifying and nerve-shattering thing. It is probably the first consideration which suggests itself to one asked to make a submarine trip. Always, the newspaper headlines dealing with a submarine disaster speak of those lost as drowned like rats in a trap. Men will admit that the progress of invention has greatly lessened the danger of accident to submarines, but nevertheless sturdily insist that when the accident does happen, the men inside have no chance of escape. As a matter of fact, many devices have been applied to the modern submarine to meet exactly this contingency. Perhaps nothing is more effective than the so-called telephone buoy installed in our Navy and in some of those of Europe. This is a buoy lightly attached to the outer surface of the boat, containing a telephone transmitter and receiver connected by wire with a telephone within. In the event of an accident, this buoy is released and rises at once to the surface. A flag attached attracts the attention of any craft that may be in the neighborhood and makes immediate communication with those below possible. Arrangements can then be made for raising the boat or towing her to some point at which salvage is possible. An instance of the value of this device was given by the disaster to the German submarine U-3, which was sunk at Kiel in 1910. Through the telephone, the imprisoned crew notified those at the other end that they had oxygen enough for 48 hours, but that the work of rescue must be completed in that time. A powerful floating derrick grappled the sunken submarine and lifted its bow above water. Twenty-seven of the imprisoned crew crept out through the torpedo tubes. The captain and two lieutenants conceived it their duty to stay with the ship until she was actually saved. In the course of the operations, one of the ventilators was broken, the water rushed in, and all three were drowned. In some of the Holland ships of late construction, there is an ingenious, indeed an almost incredible device by which the ship takes charge of itself if the operators or crew are incapacitated. It has happened that the shock of a collision has so stunned the men cooped up in the narrow quarters of a submarine that they are for quite an appreciable time unable to attend to their duties. Such a collision would naturally cause the boat to leak and to sink. In these newer Holland ships, an automatic device causes the ship, which she has sunk to a certain depth, registered, of course, by automatic machinery, to start certain apparatus which empties the ballast tanks and starts the pumps which will empty the interior of the ship if it has become flooded. The result is that after a few minutes of this automatic work, whether the crew has sufficiently recovered to take part in it or not, the boat will rise to the surface. This extraordinary invention is curiously reminiscent of the fact chronicled in earlier chapters of this book that the most modern airplanes are so built that should the aviator become insensible or incapacitated for his work, if he will but drop the controls, the machine will adjust itself and make its own landing in safety. Unaided, the airplane drops lightly to earth. Unaided, the submarine rises buoyantly to the air. In recent years, there have been developed special ships for the salvage of damaged or sunk submarines. At the same time, the navies of the world have also produced special submarine tenders or mother ships. The purpose of these is to supply a base which can keep on the move with the same degree of facility which the submarine itself possesses. These tenders are equipped with air compressors, by means of which the air tanks of submarines can be refilled. Electric generators make it possible to replenish the submarine storage batteries. Mechanical equipment permits the execution of repairs to the submarine's machinery and equipment. Extra fuel, substitute parts for the machinery, spare torpedoes are carried by these tenders. The most modern of them are even supplied with dry dock facilities, powerful cranes, and sufficiently strong armament to repel attacks from boats of the type most frequently encountered by submarines. There are, of course, many other special appliances which make up the sum total of a modern submarine's equipment. Electricity is used for illuminating all parts of the boat. Heat is supplied in the same manner. This is a very essential feature because the temperature of a submarine, after a certain period of submergence, becomes uncomfortably low. Electricity is also used for cooking purposes.
Every submarine boat built today is equipped with wireless apparatus. Naturally, it is only of limited range, varying from 120 to 180 miles. But even at that, it is possible for a submarine to send messages to its base or some other given point from a considerable distance by relay. If the submarine is running on the surface of the water, the usual means of naval communication, flag signals, wigwagging, or the semaphore can be employed. The submarine bell is another means for signaling. It is really a wireless telephone operating through the water instead of the air. Up to the present, however, it has not been sufficiently developed to permit its use for any great distance. It is so constructed that it can also be used as a sound detector. Some submarines, besides being equipped with torpedo tubes, carry other tubes for laying mines. In most instances, this is only a secondary function of the submarine. There are, however, special mine-laying submarines. Others, especially of the lake type, have diving compartments which permit the employment of divers for the purpose of planting or taking up mines. Disappearing anchors, operated by electricity from within the boat, are carried. They are used for steadying the boat if it is desired to keep it for any length of time on the bottom of the sea in a current. From this necessarily brief description, it can be seen readily that the modern submarine boat is a highly developed but very complicated mechanism. Naturally, it requires a highly trained, extremely efficient crew. The commanding officers must be men of strong personality, keen intellect, high mechanical efficiency, and quick judgment. The gradual increase in size has brought a corresponding increase in the number of a submarine's crew. A decade ago, from eight to ten officers and men were sufficient, but today we hear of submarine crews that number anywhere from twenty-five to forty. In spite of the marvelous advances which have been made in the construction equipment and handling of the submarine during the last ten years, perfection in many directions is still a long way off. How soon it will be reached, if ever, and by what means, are, of course, questions which only the future can answer. End of The Modern Submarine, Part 2 Recording by William Tomko